or his blessing over the preaching of his word. Our Lord, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, that we do not rely on our own insights, our own visions, our own dreams, our own um, fancies, but really on the preserved and written word of the living God. We ask today that um, as we set our minds on this word tonight, that our hearts would follow and that we would see Christ and him crucified in all his splendor and that the Spirit would work in us mightily to um, enlighten our hearts and to enable us to live out our faith in every waking moment of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our passage for tonight comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. It is the story of Jesus' encounter with the Canaanite woman, and it is recorded for us in verses 21 through 28 of chapter 15 uh, of the Gospel according to Matthew. I would like to, though, once more to begin reading uh, a little bit, a few verses earlier uh, in, at verse 10, and then read through uh, to give us a sense, a little bit of a sense of the uh, background of the passage, and then conclude with verse 28. So uh, we then turn to Matthew 15, beginning at verse 10. And he, that is Jesus, called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you still also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person, anyone. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Thus concludes the reading of God's word this evening. While I was still in semin seminary, um, which is not that long ago, um, uh, I once read an article titled, How to Stay Christian in Seminary. Uh, the title is interesting and it drew my attention. And the author wrote something uh, interesting that, and he wrote that seminary is a dan dangerous place. It can turn the Word of God into a textbook and a zealous discipline into uh, disciples into pompous eggheads. 
The very tool intended to bolster faith and love for God can create cold, listless hearts. In other words, what the author is saying, and I'm also testifying to it from my own experience, truly, it is that it's all too easy as a seminary student to mistake knowledge about God for knowledge of God, or what's known as faith. Um, and you, if you remember uh, the sermon this morning, you uh, can see that I'm touching on something that I touched on this morning as well. And that is that um, we can know about God without knowing God. It is like, um, a little bit like when people say that they know, they know us, when in reality they merely know of us, of our existence. They might have us as friends in social media, or we might go to the same school, we might work together. Sometimes, unfortunately, we might even go to the same church without getting to actually know one another. Spending time around each other is equated in these instances to getting to know one another. So also in seminary, um, theological growth does not guarantee spiritual growth. And you might be thinking, well, we're not in seminary, are we? Uh, but you see, since this is a heart problem, it's not unique to seminary students. The author of the mentioned article writes that whenever our affection for God struggles to keep pace with our fast-growing knowledge, this challenge remains. In other words, all of us are prone to mistake knowledge and status for faith. Now, the context of our passage tonight clearly shows that the religious elites of Jesus' day took pride in their knowledge, took pride in the tradition they possessed, thought that it amounted to much. In fact, Jesus' disciples, also, although to, to a, a very different degree, were not immune to the same temptation. And, and brothers and sisters, the reality is that neither are we. And it is for that reason that our text this evening, in the form of this interaction with this Canaanite woman, comes as a timely, as a sober, and yet encouraging, as we will see, reminder of the nature and the kind of faith embodied in this woman, the kind of faith that is great in God's eyes, irrespective of how much we know or the position that we hold. And so, let us meditate this evening on what it means to have true faith, on the marks, on the attributes, as it were, of saving faith that are before us in this text. And so, five brief points. Faith is humble, faith is desperate, it is persistent, wise, and it's answered. Humble, desperate, persistent, wise, and answered faith. And we first see in our text that faith is humble. Now, what's happening in Matthew 15 is that Jesus, being rejected by the religious elites, withdraws himself, in verse 21, to the north. He enters the area of Tyre and Sidon, uh, the territory of Canaan, and a place that historically has been a pagan enemy land. Nations that lived here were always at odds with the Jews. They were a source of religious defilement, if you may. And yet it is precisely here in this territory that Jesus meets this woman. Matthew writes, And behold, a Canaanite woman. This little phrase, and behold, is a strong marker. It is setting up something of an unusual kind. Matthew's al keeping us alert. He's preparing us for something unusual that's about to happen. happen. Something marvelous is about to take place. And indeed, we see a pagan 
woman, a pagan female, about to approach a Jewish teacher. And, to, and she's about to do it in a patriarchal world. Both religiously and socially, she is on the lowest rung of the ladder in that society. In the eyes of both the religious elites and Jesus' disciples, she is a dirty, unworthy Gentile, absolutely unworthy to approach this teacher. Culturally, historically, she is an enemy of God. All this makes it even more surprising then that she does not shy away from this, from her position in that society. Notice her posture before Jesus. She was crying after him, caring little for how others will perceive her. And she calls him, O Lord, Son of David. Now, we don't know much. In fact, we know very little of how much she actually understood about uh, these titles. But one thing is clear as we look at this text. She wanted to approach Jesus, this teacher, in the most reverent way, reverent way he, she understood how. In verse 26, she comes and kneels before Jesus. And so as we look at our text, we see that there's no presumption, no sense of entitlement with this um, woman. In, Lo in Luke uh, chapter 6, verse 17, we read this. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. And so surely this Canaanite woman had heard that Jesus had healed others from her region. Yet there's not a hint of demanding in her. She doesn't come to him and say, well, you help them, why won't you help me right now? I'm not the first pagan to come to you. Matthew Henry, the famous Puritan, writes of this. He says, it was a wonder that she did not fly off in a fret and say, is this he that is so famed for clemency and tenderness? Have so many been heard and answered by him as they talk? And must I be the first rejected suitor? Why so distant to me if it be true that he has stood, stooped to so many? He's making a valid point. She could have responded that way, and yet there's none of it in this woman. This woman embodies the humility of faith. Unlike the Pharisees and scribes earlier in the chapter who valued their ex experience and their extensive knowledge and their upholding of tradition, unlike Jesus' disciples who, though believers, esteem their national identity, unlike even the people of Jesus' own hometown who earlier in Matthew 13 rejected him on the basis not of his teaching but simply of his unimpressive family ties. Humility, you see, is the starting position and the constant companion of faith. And we know full well that no one comes to believe Christ without acknowledging and owning their desperate state, sinful state, judgment-deserving state. Still, the more I think about it, the more I'm amazed just at just how easily and quickly human heart, my heart, is to measure itself against, against others, to lift itself up by putting others down. And so as we stand honestly before this text, and as we see the humility with which this woman approaches Jesus, we are wise to remind ourselves from Deuteronomy 7.7 7, of the words that Moses speaks to God's people on behalf of the Lord. He says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, 
for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you. You see, it all starts with his love. And we can approach no other way but humbly acknowledging that, that goodness is not within us, but it's all within him. And so we begin humble to stay humble. And if we are to feed on Christ's daily Humility is that tableware with which we must do so. So faith is humble, but then we also see that faith is desperate. And as we look at our text, we find a woman who's suffering on behalf of her child. And indeed, I'm sure you will agree that one of the greatest sorrows in life is for a parent to see their child suffer, to see them fight for their life, to see them lose their fight, that fight? How helpless must a parent feel when there's nothing they themselves can do to alleviate that suffering, to prevent death? My cousin, uh, my, my, uh, my wife's cousin and his wife, I remember how they lost their firstborn daughter just three weeks after she was born. It's hard to forget the funeral, it's, it's, it's hard to remember a more sorrowful funeral. There's something profoundly unnatural about a, a child this young dying. And so if anything can make you desperate, it's your children's well-being, isn't it? And likewise, this Canaanite woman approached Jesus not for herself, but on behalf of her daughter who was oppressed by a demon. This woman knew that Jesus was her only hope. Mark, in his parallel account of this same story, tells us that Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet this woman, this lady, found out and came to him, knowing that there might not be another chance. Our most sincere, most eager cries, have mercy on me, O Lord, they do come in our darkest moments, don't they? And so such is uh, the nature of coming to faith. The road to salvation often leads through a crisis of utter despair. Many of us have experienced what theologians call the Spirit's conviction of sin, exposing exposing the depravity of our hearts, the fallenness of our nature, our inability to please God on our own, our inability to defeat sin. Can you trace in your own life, can you remember uh, ever having this experience when you knew you were going to sin and there's nothing you can do about it? Uh, A time when you felt completely helpless against it. When you knew that however hard you tried, however long you resisted, that eventually you would break down and give in. Our Lord, in his, in his wisdom and His kindness, uses, uses such uh, times of crisis to expose our desperate need for grace and to drive us to Himself. And so, this woman embodies the kind of urgency, the kind of desperation that marks true and saving faith. This knowing and being constantly reminded that Christ is our one and true hope, or one and true lifeline. Humble, desperate faith. What's more, however, we see that this faith is also persistent. As we continue looking at our text, we see that the Canaanite woman did not simply ask for the healing, and she did not simply do it once. She did not come to him and say, please help me. And if he said no, and she she went away. No, that's not what happens in our text. She continued pleading with Christ. In fact, the words in, in verse 22 that say she was crying, the Greek word behind that is an imperfect, and it suggests that she made repeated petitions. How Jesus' disciples respond and react to her also speak Volumes, speaks volumes, doesn't it? 
They surely must have come to him and begged to answer her because they deeply cared for this woman, right? Well, that's not what our text says. It was rather because clearly she was driving the man. She was annoying as nothing else. She would not give up, however. In fact, if you look at the, the way that our text, the, the story is structured, the whole passage um, consists of her requests and Jesus' responses. Her initial cries met with silence. The disciples' plea on her behalf, whatever their motives, is met with Jesus' mission statement in verse 24, where he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Finally, the whole episode climaxes on the interaction between the woman and Jesus, the interaction which vindicates her. Isn't that an illustration of Jesus' own words in Matthew 7, where he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. You see, faith is marked by this perseverant prayer with confidence that it is not who we are, how much we know, or what we have accomplished that merits anything, but it is who God is what he has promised, what he has done in Christ Jesus. However literal theology this Canaanite woman knew, and she clearly could not have known much, but she possessed this basic faith. And she was persistent. Of course, the culture around us today values persistence and tenacity. It says, never give up. Pursue your dreams. Everything is possible if you just believe. It also tells us that uh, we can find strength within. Those and other slogans are meant to inspire perseverance, to empower us, as it were. However, however, their source of persistence is found within or is supposed to be found within. These uh, slogans call us to look to ourselves to find strength to go on. But what happens if we do so? It is that the greatest threat, the greatest dread that we might have is the possibility of running, running out of steam, of this inner power, of waking up one morning to realize that we're completely empty, powerless, limited, unable, The Canaanite woman in our passage, on the other hand, fuels her persistence with something, something completely different, something that's not found within, but outside of herself. It is the unchanging nature of God. If he is good, his goodness doesn't change. If he is gracious, his grace does not run out. If he is able to answer her, his ability does not shrink. So you see, her tenacity is fueled by a source that does not deplete, not by a finite human being, but by an infinite God. She boldly and persistently approaches Christ because her faith rests not on her, but on Him, on His ability and on God's grace in the person of Jesus. And so she's holding tight who, to who He is. Perseverant faith. Fourthly, the faith of the Canaanite woman is also marked by godly wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul dedicates a portion of the chapter as he writes to, to uh, the fact that God chose to reveal his infinite wisdom through the cross, the symbol of weakness and foolishness in the eyes of the world. And so the ge gen genius of God's redemptive plan uh, lies in that such wisdom can only be accessed by a spirit-transformed, spirit-enlightened, believing heart, a kind of heart that this Canaanite woman surprisingly, unexpectedly possesses. She is marked by this godly wisdom. 
In verse 24 we read, He, that is Jesus, answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, personally, I must admit, I find this part the, one of the most fascinating parts of the whole New Testament. Because in the context of this woman's plea for help, what Jesus says on the surface of it, it looks profoundly harsh. It seems as though he's condoning national superiority. Is he a racist? Many today would be tempted, indeed are tempted, to draw such conclusions, to interpret this text this way, especially those who uh, have little regard for uh, the divine nature of Christ, the person of Christ that is true for both divine and human natures. However, Jesus' statement is not to be understood like that. It is rather to be understood in a redemptive historical sense. That's, that's a big word. But what it means is that Jesus' mission on earth at that point in time was to bring salvation to the Jews first. So Jesus, while Savior both of the Jews and Gentiles, ultimately also played a role in God's redemptive plan in a point of time. And in that point of time, he first came to call the Jews to repentance so that they, in due time, receiving the gospel and responding to, him, that, to it, would proclaim it to the Gentiles, you see. And he clearly states it in Matthew 10, verse 18. He says, And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before me, them and the Gentiles. So Jesus' intention here is not to say that the gospel is only for the Jews. No, he's saying, right now, at this point, I came first to proclaim the gospel to the Jews, and through them, then, I will work out the salvation of the Gentiles. I will send my Jewish apostles, Jewish believers, into the world to proclaim the gospel to the, uh, to, to the, to the Gentiles. But right now is my time to fulfill this role and this moment. The point is reiterated in verse 26. He says, the children of the house are fed first. Now is their time to eat. This is their food. This point, however, is phrased in such a manner so that any human wisdom would immediately be exposed. If, if there was but a hint of self-pity, a hint of entitlement, a hint of pride, of unbelief in this Canaanite woman, Jesus' words would have repulsed her. Instead, in verse 27, a truly remarkable thing happens. This pagan woman who up to that point maybe knew the infinitesimal fraction of truth that the disciples were bombarded with every day, this woman understood Jesus' words precisely and responded accordingly. Yes, she says, the children's food is theirs and the time for the dogs to eat is not yet Still, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table of grace. God's grace is such that even before the fullness of time, he has shown it to the Gentiles, giving them the foretaste of what is yet to come in a fuller manner. She knows her unworthiness. She knows also her untimeliness as a Gentile. She understands it. And yet she confidently rests on the faithful and merciful goodness of God. That's no human wisdom. That's not something that our minds can reveal to us. Such is heavenly wisdom, such is that which flesh and blood has not revealed, but the Father who is in heaven, and such is true faith. Now finally, the woman's faith is acknowledged by Christ and her request granted to her. So faith before us tonight is an answered faith. Emphatically, Jesus says, O woman, great is your faith. 
Of course, its greatness comes not from the woman herself, for we have seen that she had nothing to boast about, nothing to offer. It comes from the unwavering confidence in the Lord that she demonstrated in the Son of God. It is a humble faith, faith that understands its dependence on God and so persists with God. It is, we could call it 1 John 5, 14 faith, where it says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. By faith, this Canaanite woman, this unworthy, nameless woman, stands alongside the centurion in Capernaum as a sweet foretaste of God's blessing to the nations after the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the glorification of Christ. She is the witness out of time for what's to come in the fullness of time. And such is her faith. Such is also ours. That's the good news. The story of this Canaanite woman is our good news, brothers and sisters. How is it so? Well, it is so at least in two ways. It is both an encouragement and a reminder. Now, you see... Whoever was witnessing this encounter or listening to it being retold in, in, in later years, uh, whether Jew or Gentile, would have had the same question. How could God's enemy approach Jesus? Each one would ask this from different motives, for different reasons, but the question would be the same. The answer to that question, of course, was in the one this woman approached. It is this great reversal that we are so familiar with, that the Son of God became God's enemy on the cross so that God's enemies on earth would become his friends and his children. You see, to the Gentile audience then at that time, and to many of us now, truly Gentiles, this is incredibly encouraging. This is good news. If you think that you are not worth of, uh, you're not worth of God's grace, of salvation, that you are not good enough, this is the good news. The cross invites you to come as you are. Christ performed on your behalf, on behalf of sinners. He calls us to accept this by faith and repentance, to be like this woman who sees nothing in her and all in him. It's all of grace, it's all of him, and he calls us to receive it, receive it, and he extends that call to every single one. This is also good news in a form of rebuke, because if we think that God loves us because we are good, or because we come to church, because we know our stuff, and because we read our Bible every day, or because we go to Sunday school, then we ought to think again. Now, I'm not opposing any of those things. Those are beautiful, God-given gifts for us as believers. But if we think that those are the reasons that God accepts us, we better think again, for such were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Such sentiment was not uncommon even among Jesus' disciples. And yet the irony, the, the glorious, gracious, merciful irony is that we earn God's favor by trusting Christ as goodness and righteousness on our behalf. And you see, the moment we grasp it, and when we are uh, again challenged by it again and again, we see how this liberates us from prejudices, from legalism, how it invites us to praise the Lord with others and respond in thanksgiving and loving obedience. As we see this, then all those beautiful things, the reading of the Bible, prayer, coming to church, worshiping together, sitting in Sunday school, all those then serve the purposes of God in our lives. But the means of salvation are found in Christ Jesus. May he grant us to see it and to see it clearly every day.
Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we may maybe not think that this is um, a little thing. Uh, let us not think that uh, it's just a phrase, Father God. Rather, let us see that our Savior Christ Jesus is our life, that in Him we see and receive the riches of the triune God, the love of the Father, the work of the Spirit, the fellowship, brotherhood, and the union with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that in Him, as we are united by faith to this Savior, that through that union, the riches that He earned on the cross are fully and graciously ours. Let our, the eyes of our hearts be opened by the work of the Spirit to see this and let our hearts be made receptive to this truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.